Marino Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Marino Show. I'm your host, David Marino. I'm so excited to have my guest today. I'm speaking to Jason Garcia. Many of you know him as Rod Lane from the original Nightmare on Elm Street, but he's appeared in a number of films over the years, including Along Came Polly, We Were Soldiers, Slaves of New York. He also made a number of television appearances in shows like JAG, Facts of Life, Miami Vice. He's a published author. He's a spiritual counselor. He's an ordained minister. There's so many facets of uh, Mr. Garcia that we're going to get into, but I'm so excited to have you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, David. Great to be here on the Marino Show. Yes, thank you. First of all, <clears throat> on my show, I like to talk, obviously, about what people have done in the past. But I also want to talk about what you've done today. So I thought we would start with, you know, your acting history and how you got into that, but then kind of, you know, trans into transition into like what you're doing today. Um, as you can see behind me, I'm a huge horror movie fanatic, which is how I came to know you. I grew up watching the Nightmare on Elm Street films and all franchises, especially in the 80s, the Friday the 13th, the Halloweens, all of those. I always had a special love for the original nightmare. Um, I want to talk about you as a kid. What was it? Did you always have an interest in acting, performing? What was it that got you down that lane originally? You know, there's many answers to that as you're growing. So when I look back, you know, I can't really say bad things about that young kid. I'm 60 now. So the, so the young kid wanted... I really wanted to be a star. I thought really crazy, ambitious things like stars never die. So let me go for being a star, like the star constellation. They never die. They're just always bright. And I was obsessed with Dean Martin. And, you know, I was really uh, entertaining, dancing, just pretending all sorts of stuff for my family. And of course, I was like looked at in a Latino lat. Uh, my 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 stepfather and my mom and aunts, they're all primarily Cubans. And it's all like, they could be hardcore Latin. Like, what are you doing? And you get called all sorts of names. And then you're, if there's a spec, if there's a name for spectrum now, I probably was all that, you know, look at this crazy mad kid. But I really loved that and cut two jump. That's this is like I'm eight or something cut two. uh, I keep chasing this dream. I, you know, a lot of it is, is, you know, whether you believe in God, it's your vision and, and a lot of help from upstairs if you really uh, give it over, which I did. I do know that I was a consistent prayer. Like, even though I wasn't religious or anything, I was like, oh, God. I always felt like now that I look back, God was my partner. I didn't do it alone. So it was like I was always pointed in the right directions and I asked the right questions and I ended up through, by lucky, uh, by luck through divorce. My parent, my mom uh, moved to California, went through the whole, you know, going to school. And then I jumped into the arts, very rough. Like it was rough because I went from a football player, I didn't know what I wanted, to acting class in high school. And I was like, oh my God. In fact, is that high school or junior? I, I think it's high school. It was uh, Nightingale Junior High School. Yeah, okay. Or Bell High School, one of those. Uh, that the, the bleachers in Bell High School or one of those is where they shot Grease, the movie. The front, eventually, not more than... Four years later, I would be shooting Nightmare on Elm Street in the front of that school. The oh, one, the, the scene and, where y'all are walking up to class. Uh, uh, what a dream! Hard on, hard on. Yeah, and uh, uh, your name was written all over it. Really funny ass 1980s dialogue. But that's it was so ironic that I that school was used quite a bit for film locations. And it's in the Silver Lake area, kind of like Griffith Park Boulevard. I think it's it's not Bell High School, but it. But anyway, I would from then on. Um, I went. I knew. Um, I just inadvertently met really important people, and 
One of them was an, an agent called Ed Lamato, J.J. Harris. J.J. Harris's last thing was uh, Cherise, Cherise Throne. She, she kind of helped her in her career. Ed was Mel Gibson's agent, Richard Gere, all sorts of like Michelle Pfeiffer. Like I was on the roster. Eventually I did, he hip pocketed me, which is, uh, you don't, he doesn't tell the agency that he's working with me and he gives me leads. Remember Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? He gives me auditions because he gets the breakdowns. And there's no online digital, nothing, iPhone. It's all like, you got to show up, you get a script, you got to pick it up. Everything's analog, pick it up. And then I was going to, uh, essentially, I'm jumping all up, I'm jumping quickly to it, but it was in, in an acting class called the Vincent Chase acting class. They later would take that name and use it in Entourage. Um, and then Vincent Chase, really schooled a lot of young actors, including uh, Bill, Bill Paxton comes out of that school and the kid from uh, Tombstone and Terminator, the blonde kid, I forgot his name, uh, but he comes out of there. I come out of there. James Wilder comes out of there. And then we ended up at the Loft Studio, which was really making it, the chemistry at the Loft was amazing. It had Nick Cage was already big, but Sean, Chris Penn was hanging around. <clears throat> Sean had come, Sean Penn had dabbled with Peggy Fury and Bill Trailer. In fact, uh, the Loft Studio, the daughter, one of the daughters, Stephanie, has taken over that school, great school. It's not so much Stanislavski, it can be, and it's. <clears throat> influenced by the actor studio but much different and i i dabbled around i went stella adler i went uh the reason i'm mentioning this is you you have to have skill at some point and practice where does an actor practice a tennis player practices on the court we practice in a work in workshops and so you we went i went to howard fine even though I was somewhat successful, I still went to class to, um, and in Stella Adler's, you would meet the Three's Company actor. Jim, oh, John Ritter. John Ritter. You would meet a lot of the professionals would take a break from the career and, doubt, and come in. Michelle Pfeiffer sometimes I think came in on the Thursday classes. The really, Peggy Fury had a professional class that the working actors can come in and dabble. I'm just spending a little time with this because it's if those that if those that want to pursue acting go study, and one of them was a very uh, Uta Hagen, Uta Hagen challenge for the actor, the and and I don't know the current teachers, but I really knew that I must learn, and this is what would become the the foundation for me wanting to always study with master teachers. I knew that, so I came in. And I always wanted the information from the master, from the, and what I mean by a master is the one that has spent more than 10,000 hours doing it. You know, there's that whole saying that if you spend more than 10,000 hours, you've mastered that thing. And they're, they're, it's discipline and structure that these uh, people, men and women gave to me that would then, it go, it really is a nice, you know, jump to, oh my God, I'm working now. And Nightmare on Elm Street, I had a, I had two years before Nightmare, I got on the show Fame, the show series Fame. I was Coco's boyfriend. I thought I was James Dean. <laughs> In 1982, I was a big star. And in fact, I had a two-year hiatus. It was horrible. I did a Pepsi commercial to get my SAG card. The Fame TV series, Coco's boyfriend, Erica Gimple's boyfriend. And then it was a two year lull. Now this is what essentially kills actors is the, the in between, not what do you do for two years? And I barely made it out of that, but then I figured how to do it. And that's get yourself in a class, keep yourself busy, write, dance, keep the, you know, and then you're trying to pay rent, you know, it's very hard. So, uh, 
I got on board. I, I had an audition for a Nightmare on Elm Street. That was Ed Lovano, JJ Harris. And I was going to quit. And I walk in, and because I was in that funky mood, I got the audition, Wes Craven. And Wes says, hey, we're auditioning, stick around. We're auditioning for um, the jock. And that's how he said it, jock, the jock. Because ideally, the Johnny Depp role was like some, I imagine some tough football player, muscular, you know, a jock hot dude. I was like sort of the Italian hot dude. You know, like I had no identity then, so I was combining John Travolta, Kanicki, Grease, just really shallow. <laughs> I was just trying to figure what the hell I am, what am I doing? And and I was emulating. Uh, when I look back at the movie, I'm just copying. I'm not really, except in the jail cell, I really start bringing in the acting technique and bringing in my pain and, and learning how to work with that without uh, you know, opening up a can of worms, but, uh, Johnny got the part, uh, Johnny Depp. We all didn't know anything about anybody. We knew he was in a rock band, but we were all ordinary. He did have an edge as I did. I had Ed Lamato, big agent. He had Nick Cage's uh, manager and he was friends with Nick Cage. So after work, Nick Cage would pick him up and they'd take off. Nick was already riding the wave of success um like valley girl and all that was out at yeah he was pretty big and he, everybody knew his uncle was coppola even though he was faking the cage part um and he had done he was just about to do the sean penn role with him and sean they're like buddies it was a great fervent year let me set the the landscape is we have to give everything over to Matt Dillon. The landscape of the 80s uh, and the way the studios were giving, you know, taking chances and making movies with young kids, unknowns, that's the landscape. A lot of money was spent. 21 Jump Street, 21 Jump Street, not just had Johnny Depp, it had Dom DeLuise's kids in there. I can't remember their names. And one of them, Peter, Peter DeLuise. He ended up becoming an amazing director uh, for many series in in uh, in Canada. And you mentioned Matt Dillon. Matt Dillon, I remember I was a kid, but he was huge at that it's time. Huge. He had the movie X. He had a lot of different films. Uh, you know, he's an under he's such an underrated actor. He's the guy, man. He opened the doors. He had that cool all-American. And he opened the doors for Tom Cruise because Matt was bigger than Tom before Tom hit Risky Business. And then they were in The Outsiders together. They were in The Outsiders. And now, now The Outsiders was a big bomb, like an explosion, not financially. An explosion of most of those kids became stars. And I was in there. I was not in. I auditioned for Outsiders. And then I ended up getting another. It, it, there was plenty of work for everybody. Nobody suffered. You know, and there's a difference between, oh, my God, you hit a hit or you hit a bomb, but you still work. And Johnny went off to 21 Drum Street be because he wasn't doing films yet until he did Cry Baby. But it was Johnny in the, uh, you know, he, he was married at the time. We all, Heather, Amanda, We'd all end up at his house eating spaghetti and watching Wes's like earlier films like The Hills Have Eyes and stuff like that. I can't believe I'm remembering all this stuff. But uh, uh, then um, we would go to, uh, you know, we'd all talk and we and then our kind of pseudo mom was Wes Craven's wife, ex-wife, got her name. She was amazing. So we don't we don't end up at Wes's house, and th they were our parents. We were just these twenty something year olds, and we shot at the Desilu Old Studio, and it was 1984. I remember the Olympics, and my life would change forever, because right immediately, I had known about this producer friend who wrote a script called Gotcha, 
And, and I screen tested with Craig Schaefer, though he didn't get it, I got it. But it was Johnny Depp that recommended me because he got a script. So that's, you know, that's another way that uh, I really was so lucky. I listened and I heard people talk about scripts and what, what I recommend for young artists. I don't know what the culture is today, but uh, acting studios and hanging out with actors created a network of information. And it was like, what's going on? Have you been up for this role? And remember, there's only one role, and there's like 14 of us that look the same. But we'd all be supporting one another. Hey, I love you. What are you doing? Well, you don't have work. How about this? Have you heard about this? They're doing this. And that's how. And then uh, Johnny was very, you know, everybody was kind. Everybody was, you know, supporting one another. And we broke out. I went and did Gotcha. Johnny's doing something. We lost touch. <clears throat> Maybe they're working on the next nightmare, but I'm gone. I'm doing movies now. The next movie. And then I got Wildcats. I Gold loved Man. Wildcats. I loved Goldie Hawn growing up. And um, that was one of my favorite movies from that era. I, I love that movie. And then I, you know, I would meet other people that you were schmoozing with. You know, everybody was exploding. There are about three, four stars that popped out of that one. And uh, he did Cheers, uh, Woody, Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and this other cat, and they blew up. I mean, this, this other cat did New Jack City. Woody took off, and I was taken off. But I turned down some studio movies to be a lead, and I had a, a bit of a flop. I had like a floppy decade. <laughs> But uh, I got greedy and I wanted to tra have a trajectory rather than there is like you're just status quo because the next picture that I would get, I could have got and I turned it down was um, Heartbreak Ridge. The studios start hiring the same ensemble groups. And then I got hired on Bull Durham. And, uh, and I didn't want to be ensemble. And part of it was my ego. I don't know. But I followed. All I can say is I made no mistakes, but I followed my truth at the time. And my truth said something else. My truth was my ego, my truth. It wanted something more. And then I, you know, I got a series of B cable lead movies. And you're learning that way. I was a little impatient. And then I, I, I had a series of, I mean, I think I've lasted four decades as a working actor and it pays my pension. I'm good. I'm happy. SAG's been good to me. So I've been really successful in my way. I, I, I can only say that I learned so much. And then I also learned what I didn't want. And I did not want at some point. It would have been nice to be on the level of Tom Cruise, but I'm, I don't think I want that. And I knew that's why I didn't go so far. Because I, in order to go there, you got to do it like 100% and not have a doubt. And I always had a niggle. If you have a niggle, it's over. And I knew that my niggle would only get me so far. And the biggest film, uh, blockbuster-wise, well, but, well for, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street still takes care of me. But the, the current is Along Came Polly. It would, be, it would be a huge, I had several comebacks. You know, I, I never died, you know. Was like, and all that is my teacher, John Rogers, 1988. Hooked up with him, worked for him. And he was the perfect manifester of God. It wasn't like I went religious and crazy. It went like I went nothing. Just like um, I had taken a couple courses with Tony Robbins and Walk on Fire. And an actor is an artist, is a brave individual that jumps off the cliff. And, and there's unlimited experiences and unlimited manifestations. Look at every actor that makes it. He goes, I've dreamed this because it's true. You 
can. And but there's an, a warning that my teacher says: be careful what you ask for; you might get it. And I knew, I knew, I knew Tom Shadiak, Tom Shadiak, who did the Nutty Professors and all the movies. He fell on his bike, had amnesia, and gave it all up. It's like so. I'm telling you, it's like life is very interesting. You know? Well, I love that you brought up John Roger because, you know, in you know, hand in hand with your your acting work, you have a spiritual life and developed that. Um, you know, you mentioned something interesting earlier about you know your success and just what your version of that was or vision of that was rather. And also we talked about ego. Um, and with acting, we were talking a little before the interview started. I'm not an actor, but I would imagine anything, and it could be in any field, but especially where you're up front and center and you're, the focus is all on you. It would feel, especially as a young person, that that would be hard to keep in sync, like your ego and the amount of attention you're getting versus, you know, I don't know, just like being in on the work, it seems like the ego part would start to creep in and start making decisions sometimes for you. Or I, I don't know. I, I want to see what your perspective is on that. And well, how, you know, we talked about earlier that you're now a spiritual counselor and ordained minister. How did the spiritual part of your life come into play when you were in that world and, and that time of acting and, and what happened that kind of, got you into that world and that path well thank you it's a great question uh, to be clear uh, there's just been so much misinterpretation of i did a lot of studying psychology and all that but that's when you want to be uh, objective more objective but to be fair the acting world the actor uh does teach you to be objective because you're learning about a character so but at the same time we have to be good we have to be good and okay with our ego because our ego is our body it's we have a soul and the ego does the work you know and so you can't be like trashing the ego but you got to watch it like hey my mouth's talking too much i am sleeping around a bit too much what's going on and not in a judgmental kind of way but in a directive way. So the ego gets up, you know, you need, and we, we also have like a basic self, which is the little, it's not a psych, psycholo psychological little kid in us, but there's a little man inside of us that kind of just wants to take it easy. What's going on? I'd like to go dancing. Can we go eat? I need a pizza, you know, but the ego uh, ends up growing uh, you know, and I don't, I don't want to say anything negative, but Trump is a great, <clears throat> is a great example of an ego that has grown. He got, he just, he's, a, if you want to learn without being negative and being criticizing, I'm not criticizing Trump. I don't, I'm not a political dude, but all actors and all artists, if you're a real artist, you observe and you, you, uh, Trump has a, I'll give you examples real quick. You, me, him, we all have like, um, perceptions. Perception is an edited observation, David Hawkins. And this, and in the acting world, we, we get to that place more often. And it can scare certain actors and they'll go off and do drugs or party. But uh, because after the work is done, it's restless. They must, an actor, I live this, an actor must go and get clean. You must go clean yourself, shower yourself from that character that you, which is really you, parts of you that you exposed that you normally don't in your life. So the Elvis guy, for instance, the guy that played Elvis, he's, he's walking away talking like it and being like it it's going to be a while before we get him back because he really went in i mean i thought his his interpretation of it was awesome the perspective the the thing is to as a 
as an interviewer, you or me, is to be a, take a perspective of it and look at Trump and go, well, hmm, be in his shoes. How did he grow up to be like that? Without criticizing, because the great thing about an actor, this is the greatest thing about an actor, a great trained actor doesn't judge his role and doesn't judge his character. He observes his character because actors play villains and good guys and bad guys. I've played Che Guevara. Che Guevara was a revolutionary killer. I can't, I'm a Cuban. My family was against Che Guevara and Fidel. I, I have to approach it when Andy Garcia asked me to play this after I got it uh, and gave me the role. Um, it's a, it was a long dream of playing this character to play a guy that was in my household. And, you know, it's, can you imagine a Jewish actor who in the family, they're talking about the Holocaust and we lost relatives. And then this Jewish actor gets the role of Hitler's right hand man. Yeah. That that's yeah. gotta be a lot to like reconcile with. Yes. The, yeah. So that actor must, cannot be biased. That actor must be, I'm going to observe, learn what the Nazis were about this character. Why did he follow Hitler, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's why, and the ego, the, you know, ego growth, again, back to, um, uh, you know, you can, take, uh, you can take a Che Guevara character or a Trump character, at what point do they lose the connection of the awareness, the checking in of the ego? What point did they lose that? And they're just a locomotive going 100 miles, 100, 200, 300 miles an hour. And it's just an ego, a well-trained ego, by the way, using the enlightenment of the being. And uh, you know what happens to the ego? It dies. It only has a lifespan. <laughs> But our souls continue on and we, you know, the way I was trained and the way that I know from my experiences and what I've read and put together is we just keep jumping into bodies that we can use our ego. Our ego is my, my understanding of the ego is what I think and what I feel is true. And what happens is when that apparatus thinks it knows, have you ever thought you knew and then you were wrong? Yes. There have been many times when that's happened. Yes. And, that's a, and so that's a good example of your awareness, knowing that your ego tricked you, your mind. But uh, a person that's a Trump or a person that is a, that has overgrowth in the ego area thinks and feels he's right. And that's, that's the, can, that's really what's going on in the world. A bunch of egos are tripping out thinking they know and they feel that they're right. And then I think I know I'm right. And then there's no dialogue. No one's listening. It's disconnect. And no one's doing critical thinking. And therefore you have really bad polarizing. And, uh, and nobody's real. And the other thing about the greatest thing about an actor is listening. The improv rule is yes and and. Uh, Amy Poehler, I took her a master class, and and every other acting class. And I suffer from my career's always suffered because of listening and how critical a great actor is. A great listener. And, and what is that? It should be a great human being. It should always be a listener. Actors are fascinating creatures because they're given super tools. They're given huge tools on awareness. And then the ego gets crazy when they get the Oscar and the money and the women and the men and the drugs. And the, the, the worst thing about the actor environment is you're working on a four month movie on the set where they give you everything you want. There's always someone getting you stuff. You want a coffee, Mr. Garcia? Yeah, I got you. The trailer's warm. It's ready for you. I got this. Everyone's at your beck and call. And, and rightfully so. It's cool because it moves. Your makeup's ready. I'll get you this. 
and it ends in four months. But then you go home and your wife's like, shut up and take the trash out. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I would imagine that has to be the most difficult transition back into normal life when you're like treated the way you are yeah. as an actor on a film set to but that. That's but that's an ego check. That is a person that should take take it take the mundane route. Like I heard, Daniel Day Lewis, you know, became a, a shoe repair person, does very simple things. That's really mundane, simple, ordinary things. Is a healing phenomenon for the actor to reset and then go back out. Like I like Meryl Streep. I think she's a housewife, you know, mother, a wife, you know, the whole, you know. You have to, you can't take acting seriously because you can't bring that into life. It doesn't exist. It is a, it is a, at best, it's a circus, you know, it's a three ring circus. There's magic movies. It's done. And then you go home and then you got to deal with kids are sick. Got to pay rent. Your wife is trying to get you to be come down off the pedestal. Hey man. Um, and so, and then there's people that don't have a life, they just have acting and they go from one to another, to another. And that, that is an ego growth, but they, it's a machine. You go and do yoga, take seven weeks of retreat, go inside, be quiet. Uh, but I, I, I think the, the movie field is a very interesting field. I think that's, I'm sure singers go through the same thing. I'm fascinated with Lady Gaga. And when I saw her whole um, entourage and what she does, to, concerts must be very similar. Like, you know, nine, yeah, nine months touring with you 2 I mean, that must be incredible. But yeah, I've read uh, Bono's, book and he's pretty ego check i really like like he's got a wife and kids and they'll check him you know and the band members check you so the question is are you open to hearing and being aware and change and someone like a trump which is a great example not as a negative just a learning as an actor it doesn't really listen per se just kind of go he hears you and then he does what he does. Now the great, the, the, his inability to do anything other than the focus he has is something every actor does and every other person does. He does it pretty extreme. And in my opinion, not as a healthy, not a healthy, uh, but the drive is a good example is there is nothing uh, that should stand in your way when you're going for it. You, you don't, you don't, I don't know how he did it, but it's very interesting. You've got to watch your negative. He like a good example of what he does. He does over affirmations on himself. I'm great. This is good. That's not a bad thing to do for yourself. I'm not saying he's doing it bad or wrong. I'm saying, it is good to wake up in the morning and going, hey, man, I love myself and I'm going to do great this morning. I mean, how many times do I know of people, including myself, that I get up in the morning and I'm like, I feel like crap. I don't, I'm a failure. I'm not going to do it. Okay. You know, take, take the best you can from the people that you see out there. That are, it's NLP, by the way, Neuro Linguistic Program. Tony Robbins talks about that, you know. And it's almost like Stella Adler talked about the what if. And John Roger talked about the law of assumption. So assume the position that you are the president. Assume that you are the actor. And you start to let your creativity and your imagination, before you know it, you pull it into you. Same thing works for negativity. Oh, I'm never going to make it. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to go bankrupt. And it's the reticular activating system and the constant thing, your mind just pulls in disaster. You know, this is why you're, you promote, you create, and you allow everything you do in your life. And if you do that, you're a master. And you're right about the negative. Cause I've always had an issue with, you know, like the confidence and I've had to really work on that through therapy and different things. But 
you do bring in, if you have a negative mindset and think you're not going to accomplish something, you're never going to be anything. And you have this voice that's constantly doing that. It does bring that you kind of manifest what you're putting out. And I've always struggled with that. Even to this day, you know, I still have to keep myself in check with that thinking um, because it's hard. It's hard if you've always thought a certain way to start changing yeah. the, the mindset. And, you know, through your spiritual work, again, John Roger was like your master. Yeah. Right? How did you meet him? How did you get into, you know, writing the books and doing the documentary on John Roger? Like, how did that come to be that you ended up meeting him? And, and you know, now you are teaching. You are like, you know, somebody that has a lot of experience in that world. How did that come to be for you? Good question. And if not, I wanted to add on what you're saying. John Rogers said he created a, he wrote a book called You Can't Afford the Luxury of a Negative Thought. And he came up with that term. And what that means is you can have a positive goal and you can be OK with negative and positive thought, thinking You can have a positive goal and be OK with negative and positive thinking. What does that mean? It means like, I want to get this movie role. And it's okay that you wake up in the morning going, I'm not going to get it. That's okay. Because I guarantee you, most actors have that, that they're afraid of something. But that, but my teacher says, use that. That's, that's performance energy, right? You could take negativity and go, oh my God, I'm never going to get it. Or take that energy and use it as performance energy, creativity, and grab it. Um, I met JR doing courses i call him jr john roger i needed after i finished movies i needed to clean up do some inner work like you talked about a therapist uh there's there's courses that you can do that kind of parallel that kind of thing. it's a it's another way of looking at yourself through reflection that but at this point, at 60, I realized we're all mirrors to each other. We all project and reflect. And I took this I course. To, I just have to stop. That's very powerful. Yeah. Oh, we yeah. Reflect and project. Project. That, that, yeah, that's very powerful. That's true. And uh, I lived that. I lived that learning that. And uh, I wasn't quite. You know, I was very ego driven still. And that's not a bad thing because I knew what I wanted. And I wanted to be around someone like him. I ended up moving in with him, working with him. I, I learned insight and I was married at the time. I divorced. Uh, it was just perfect timing. I went to Egypt. He had uh, these trips that were called, everyone's doing trips now, you know, like Mateo from Gaia Channel. And I think. Helen Hayes was doing it. Helen, no, um, who was doing it? Oh, Robert Holden's, Robert Holden, great the guy. These are all great people that do trips out into the world and they kind of create an ambiance. And one of them was uh, an Israel, an Egypt Israel trip, basically four weeks. And I couldn't wait to get on it. And basically, you do processes and meditations on the Nile while you visit temples. And it was called Peace Awareness Training Number Four. And then we went into Israel, Promised Land. And it was all metaphoric, more metaphorically used, not religiously used. That bondage would be in Egypt, the discovery of initiations, and then into Israel for liberation. And, and it, 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 really, it really resets everything that you ever thought. Uh, I think Mark Twain said, Something like uh, traveling reduces ignorance, you know, essentially. So there I am traveling, learning. And um, the Egyptian, I ended up doing uh, that course. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to, I want to move in and work with you. So I worked uh, very closely with him. And at the same time, I was really pulled for acting. I wasn't going to completely give it up. But I lived very much uh, like this world is spirit. And then he taught me how to integrate it, that <clears throat> there is no separation, that you can, spirit is in the work. 
and I started to use a great story uh, with him. I'm at a plantation soup, soup plantation. It's a place where you get soup. Angela Lansbury, you remember her, Mrs. T. Murder, she wrote all of the theater work she's done yet. So uh, she was doing Murder, she wrote, and I needed to continue to work. After I got divorced, moved in with him, I was like, yo, I, I really want to work and still work with you. And he goes, all right, I'll help you. So we're eating lunch and he's like, go over there. And, I, and this is the beginnings of everything is possible. This blew my mind. And I, and this is why uh, negativity and contraction is just sort of like an evil way of keeping the human from expanding into what he is, which is not the God, but ye, ye are gods. And it's in the Bible. Like we're not the guy, but we have those God powers. Go and do it. And he goes, go over there and ask her for a job. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And I was quite courageous and bold. And I went over there. I said, I, hi, my name's, it was Nick Corey at the time. Hey, I'd like a job. And she goes, well, are you talented? And I said, yes, I am. I was very bold. And she goes, well, send me a tape. Back then you sent a VHS tape. Yeah. She calls me and I end up doing two uh, murder she wrote so i did it with john saxon and oh from nightmare on elm street yeah. was, we united he's a really good guy and then i ended up where john roger lived it was right next to john saxon so i would have a lot of run-ins with john and, uh but that's what that's a that's a miracle story that i that then from then on jr would influence my career tremendously in ways that i couldn't uh uh, they just went on strike. Another story. They just went on strike. Hollywood. No, they were threatening to go on strike right away. And everything was being green, green lit. Green lit is a term where they green light the picture for shooting. Green light, green lit. So what happens is the threat of a strike moved all these scripts that weren't ready for shooting to start shooting. One of them was We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson. I was like, man, I want this so bad. And I had just finished Arnold Schwarzenegger film. And I had had a re a rebirth in my career. And it was Kathy Sandwich. 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 Uh, she was a casting director. You can't, actors can't do anything without casting directors. And uh, these cast, if casting director hates you, you'll never come in, nor will you get that role. She loved me. And I got a continuous bump. I would get... Uh, all these movies, but I had to come through. It's not like they got you the role. You got to, they're like, I'm going to get you in at three and you got to come in punching. You know, you're like a content, you're like a, a boxer, essentially. We were soldiers. JR, you know, as JR goes, you want this? Yeah. Well, just put your hands out and say, I want it. And I went in and I, I got it. Uh, and this, this is the good stories. The other stories with him is, I went out one year, 80 times, 80 auditions, never got anything, 80. And 2% of it was coming in second. There's nothing worse for an actor than to come in second. I'd rather not have heard that I was at the top. And that was brutal, 80 times. And then this one agency, uh, acting agency, sends a letter and say, we compute that you will not be working with us we did the, the, the statistics, the analytics at the time, and we don't see you working with us, so we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> the letter was like that. And these are down times that you have to, and John Roger helped me through all of it. And, and a lot of it was you can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. That negative thought will kill you. Now you can do it, but you have to have a positive goal that gets you out of bed. Positive goal, I'm gonna get that part. Negative energy, negative thought, I probably won't. Well, I'm still gonna drive over there. I'm still gonna get in the door. And Is then, that how you kept yourself going when you were dealing yeah. with that? Yeah, you create a word called persistence and dedication and determination. And so even if I left the audition room and I didn't feel good, I'd go back in and say, excuse me, can I do it again? Like really until 
I was a very aggressive until I didn't want to do it anymore. But then I ended up, the very thing that I hated, which was auditioning, I ended up loving it and it became an art. And, and so you end up with that, which you sometimes dislike, if you can embrace and, and go through the haze moment, the hazing of it, you know what I mean by college hazing? It's all, ha it's all gonna haze you to make you a better, stronger, more determined, and experienced human because remember we're all doing all this not for a paycheck we're doing it to experience you know your soul ultimately is that body's going to die but the soul continues and the soul wants experiences what does it want oh it wants family if you're up for that oh, i want to buy a house what's that like i want to be successful what's that like and and meeting John Roger, I was at the point of the worst time of my life, thank God. And most changes for people don't happen when you don't want it. They happen when you want it. And they happen when you want it, when things aren't working out. And when you hit bottom, hopefully you live and then change. Some people hit bottom and they're dead. Um, so you got to hit bottom to like JR says, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, you change. And then spirits there, God's there, you know, whatever you believe in Allah, they'll come. Oh, I need this. And before you know it, someone calls you, Hey man, I'm going to Mexico. You want to do this retreat? And all of it is to find, to keep in the words of Socrates, uh, you know, an unexamined life is not worth limit, living. An unexamined life is not worth living. I kind of screwed up the quote, but it's like that. You have to, you've got to go after examining your life in every vocation you do. You can't just be super busy for the salary. You know, and people, I think a lot of people do that. They they think the money is going to make them happier. I think a lot in our in our culture, which is you know what I have struggled with in the past, but I late, you know, as of now, I don't look at it that way. I want to be happy and productive and happy with what I'm putting out in the world. But I think a lot of people were taught from an early age that success means money. It means attaining all of these things. And that's not really, it doesn't make people happier. You see it all the time. People have everything and they're still miserable. Yeah. I, I, you know, you can have all that and still be happy, but that's not going to make you happy. So go, go do the things that make you happy. Like, you know, some people, the, the successful people that I know that are spiritual, um, they're not chasing the money. It just comes to them because they're able to, um, use the money, not make the money. They use the money to give them a better experience of what they're going after like they're you know and they they may um, they're not it, it's a lot of responsibility to to have money you have to be careful um what you ask for because it comes you will get the 30 million you want but then you know where are you with the three houses and the maintenance and you've got all this cash flow you have you know, do you want to spend that? There's people that do. Do, do I want to spend that time of my, my life payrolling three houses, staff, a company? No, I do want to be comfortable and wealthy, but I don't want to do that. So, you know, they talk about, you know, a, um, I was taught about doing like a treasure map, you know, or an ideal scene. You got to be real detailed in that. So you could, because you, everyone is a powerful visionary person. So another case, JR helped me. I said, JR, I want, I want to be successful in this movie. I got the movie, but I was cut out. So then I, the next thing I wrote and I put in a treasure, I want to be in a successful movie and I want to be in the movie, not edited out, but you know, I don't do the negative. I'll be, I like to be in four scenes with like Meryl Streep type woman. And then I did that, but the movie didn't make any money. It wasn't successful. So then I wrote, I want to be in a blockbuster hit over 80 million, 
You know what I mean? I got real detail. God's in the detail. I want four or five scenes with the lead actors and I get residuals and it gets me the next part. That was Along Came Polly. Because I, I did We Were Soldiers, but they cut half of my performance out. You know what I mean? So I started to, uh, you know, it, it's very, it's very like Jim Carrey talks about, he wrote himself a $20 million check. I, I've heard that. I've heard him tell that story on in his interviews. Yep. It's so real. This is real. The, the, the game in the world is real. But how detailed do you want to be? So you just don't say, I want a relationship. You know, I know a lot of women. I counsel them. I want a relationship. Whoa. You could get a relationship with a dog. And, you know, mm -hmm. or do you, most people are denying a relationship with themselves first. So they're jumping to the outside. So what kind of relation? Well, what does he look like? Well, I'd like him to be a doctor. All right, so you want him to doctor. And do you want him to be a poor doctor? No, no. So you just got to be very clear about what you're asking for. I'd love to be wealthy and live in a house and have this amount of money. And this is the kind of job I could do. You know what I mean? And then you cut out, you could cut out treasure photos about what it looks like. And, or you can write it out. I see myself, I am abundant, radiant, enjoying my life in, you know, in Austin, Texas, enjoying the weather in this nice three story house. You know what I mean? You really start to see it, but really cover yourself because is the land structurally capable? You know, do you own the mineral rights? So you get this house and then they kick you out because you don't own the mineral rights. You know what I mean? So cover yourself in your wants. And this is what John Roger helped me with in clarifying specifically things I wanted. And they, they all come true. I have no qualms about anything in my life. There are ups and downs, but eventually is what he told me. I'm not going to, things are not going to go away, but I will minimize your downtime. I will minimize your downtime. Okay, when I was first acting, downtime was like two years. Oh my God, I didn't get this movie, it's over. Now, downtime is like three minutes. You feel it, you express it, and you move on. You have uh, two books that are out as well, The Dreams of a Master, The Love of a Master. You made a film about John Roger. If people are interested in reading your books, watching the documentary about John Roger, or working with you in a spiritual capacity, how can they go about doing that and finding you? They could just email me, but my books are on Amazon. The books, basically after my friend died, I, in case I lost my mind, I wanted to write books about our experiences and some of them are magical. They're on Amazon, the love of a master and the dreams of a master. And the dreams of a man, the love of a master is really right after I'm, I'm grieving. And I go do a psychology course. It's really cool. USM, University of Santa Monica, Spiritual Psychology. These are our projects. And then I did the dreams of a master, which is I still journal since I was 16, which is what every artist should do or anyone. Journaling is great. And I journal. And yeah, and I do, uh, I do dream journaling and, and I, try to identify the different dreams I have. I love dreams and what they mean. And so I write in the book, the dreams of the master techniques and also what he taught me how to make things manifest, the dreams. What's one thing, and this will be one of the last things, because I love that our conversation though has focused on the spiritual and your, you know, what, how that intersected and how that carries carries you through even today because i think that's a very important message for everybody out there to hear myself included i think that is that is the message that people need to hear right now especially um but one thing just that you can think of from nightmare that sticks out to you in making the film i did get to have a nice relationship with wes craven we play racquetball quite a bit you know i ended up doing I would play West to give me parts and I beat him. 
and he gave me uh, Vampire in Brooklyn. The Eddie Murphy film, yeah. I mean, and then I, I bribed him for the new Nightmare. It's not the new, the... Uh, Wes Craven's new Nightmare? Yeah, that one. Yeah. So they, Wes is back. And I'm like, why hasn't he called me? And I'm like, yo, I got the leather jacket. Give me a roll. So I gave him the leather jacket, my leather jacket, Rod Lane's. And then oh, I, no. So you don't have it anymore. <laughs> so I had the, I, he's got it. And then I, and then he passed away. And that was really, that was sad. That was weird. Um, I didn't know he was sick, but, uh, but I did three films with him, you know? I was like, hey, you know? Uh, but West, but Nightmare was nobody knew, you know, and the uh, and and shout out to the the special effects were all real analog special effects. There was nothing digital. Your scene, your kill scene, was I I that was a really um, just the you way they hanging? filmed it. I yeah. love the hanging. Yeah. Yeah, they were. Oh, that. Yeah, of course. Duh, special effects. The tongue out the phone was so like incredibly funny, and how they build a pool so they grabbed her and pulled her down. The third was, you know, they took from an old Fred Astaire dancing, and I think it goes to Charlie Chaplin, how the whole house moves when uh, I think Fred Astaire would dance, and then Charlie. But they had a rotating room. Everything was basically glued down. So they tied everybody down and put us upside down. Camera that was work. for Tina's kill? Tina's kill. And my kill, The uh, that was a bit amateur. I don't think they knew what they were doing. They put fishing line and they put me on a vest, crushing your nuts. And, you know, and, you know you're like this and like that. And they paint you white. I didn't like the makeup on that. It, this is all white, but my neck's regular color. And then they pull me up, but the fishing line broke. So then they had to get like, I, I think I weighed a, a buck and a feather over that then. It was super thin. And then I, uh, so he hangs me. And then the, the amazing reversal of the film, how the towel, they reversed that. So they tied me, they tied the towel around me and then shot it, leaving my neck and then just reversed it. So then I just, when it did this, I, I had to start like this, ah, and then they filmed it, closing my eyes as it leaves. So then they reversed it and they get me opening my eyes as it's coming in.